worship and that, that, that <laughs> eyes crusty worship that you fall out and worship all over the floor. Amen? Amen. Y'all remember those days? I know some of y'all grew up coaching for Pentecost and they know what I'm talking about. Yes. Amen. But that's what I was I've been longing for. And lo and behold, how many know that God gives you what you need? Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. So in the class that I'm taking through uh, Indiana Wesleyan, the class I'm taking right now is called A Spiritual Life and Leadership. And this book, that we, one of the books that we have is by Richard Foster, and it's called Celebration of Discipline, The Path to Spiritual Growth. And this book right here, I was like, man, you're kind of bold, talking about you going to have the path to spiritual growth. You, you got some nerves, right? Nobody's going to label it as the path, like you got the dictionary, amen? You got the encyclopedia, amen? You got the internet, that means it is it, amen? There is nothing else. You have the Bible, amen? Yeah. Well, this is the path of spiritual growth. I was like, oh, man, here we go. I'm at the Indiana Wesleyan University taking this course about spiritual leadership and spiritual development, and they're going to have a book that's called The Path. Well, we're going to see what it's like. Well, if you dug into the book, it broke down life in us into three basic principles, inward, outward, and corporate. So the inward discipline that we need to work on deals with our thoughts, our mindsets, Amen. Our attitudes, yeah. ours, our interactions, how we relate to each other, our tone of voice that we use with someone else, the demeanor that we carry about, and then deals corporately how we as a group come together and worship God because we have been called as a church to fellowship together with each other. Yeah. So in the inward disciplines, it deals with prayer, meditation, Bible study, and fasting. Amen. So we all know that the, the pre three principles that we do focus on a lot is the prayer, the Bible study, and the fasting. And I don't know about you guys, but when I heard meditation as being a discipline and growth, I was like, yeah, right. Because to me, meditation has always been part of that Asian culture, the Asian religion, the Asian environment where you sit down and do yoga. Yeah. Amen? Or you sit down and, mm. I don't know what you want to call that, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Y'all go ahead and, oh, y'all want to, amen? That's what I thought of. But yet, on page 24 of this book says, meditation helps to create the emotional and spiritual space which allows Christ to construct an inner sanctuary in the heart. That was deep. I'll say it again. Create the emotional and spiritual space which allows Christ to construct an inner sanctuary in the heart. So that's the point of meditation. And then, what also hit me was we say it every Sunday, Psalms 19 and 14. What does it say? Let the words of my mouth. Meditation wait, wait, stop. Let the words of my mouth enter. And let the words of my mouth enter. But yet, I was thinking there was some kind of, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all know about Bible study as being a part of it. We got fasting, and we know about what well, fasting is just a discipline to abstain from something, whether it be food, whether it be watching a TV show, whether it be listening to the type of music. It's just abstaining from something. You're disciplining your body, you're disciplining the flesh in the order to gain something spiritually. Bible study, we all know about 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And then we got to the outward disciplines that he talks about. There's four outward disciplines that he has. Simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. Now, one of those is a cuss word to some people, and that's submission. But we'll get to that some other time. Amen? <laughs> all right, so simplicity means just basically getting rid of all the unnecessary stuff in your life. So if you have too many clothes, amen, we live in America. We have too many clothes. We got too much food. Amen. Simplifying it. Getting it to where you have the base means that you need to survive so that you can focus on God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Solitude. Time alone. That goes back to that. Mm -hmm. Amen, right? <laughs> Solitude. You need to spend time alone with somebody. It's good to unplug. We went on a camping trip not too long ago with, with uh, another family here in the church, and it was good for us to unplug just to get away, just to get away from all of the, the, the cell phones, the computers, the laptops, the busy busy that we have created for ourselves. We need to unplug and have that relationship with God on occasion. Submission. Oh, no, man, that's that cuss word, right? <laughs> submission. The way he presented submission was totally profound. He just put my head in one of those poof moments. Amen? So he just defined submission as being self-denial. Self-denial. If we thought about submission as being self-denial, how much better we would be. Self-denial means freedom to give in to another's point of view. A freedom to give in. Not that you have to, you're giving yourself that freedom to give in to another point of view. That was one of those poof moments. Amen? Amen. 
And then service. Indiscrimination of tasks, rank, or emotion. So what needs to get done gets done because of the fact that I want to do it. Not because I have this rank or you have seniority or because it's in my job description. It's because I want to do it. Amen? Amen. And then he talks about corporate discipline. And this is one of those things that I come from coaching background. And one of the things that he talked about was confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. And confession, I grew up coaching. I went to Notre Dame. I seen the two extremes of confession. Two extremes of confession. Amen? So what we view as confession was you go to one another in person and you talk about it in private and God forgives you. Then you go to the other extremes where you go to someone who is supposed to be forgiving you because that's their role. However, what he presented was also one of those proof moments. We as Christians are obligated to go to one another and forgive. We each should have a confidant that should, not, that should be outside of our spouse. We should have a confidant that we can go to and confide in them so that when we confess our faults one to another, they can forgive us because they're representing God because God lives within us. Amen. That was one of those moments I was like, wow. I didn't think about that. This was backed up in another book that I read where this preacher said that he was going to go call one of his friends who was the mega, mega, pastor of a mega church in California. He was going to go call him and talk about some things that he was doing wrong in his life and he wanted to confess and get it off his chest. So he said when he picked up the phone and called him and said, hey, listen, I need to talk to you. I, I really need to ask you for forgiveness for some things that's going on because I need you, I, I really just, I'm just, it's just burning, burning inside me. And this said, before he can even start his confession, this preacher that he looked up to laid all his sins on him. He said, hold on, hold on, dude. I'm looking up to you and you telling me all this stuff? But he said, at that point in time, instead of condemning him, the Holy Spirit condemned him and said, you are representing God at this point in time, so forgive your brother. Amen. So how many times do we go through life and put other people on a pedestal not knowing what they're going through? Not, going, not knowing the things that they've had to see, not knowing the things that they've had to, to view, but yet we need to realize that they are the same people that are just like us. So for us to condemn somebody else, we're no better than them. Amen? Amen. 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 And then guidance. That's why we come to church. Hebrews 10 and 25. Not forsaking the assembly or of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting, lifting up, praising, reassuring, urging, or inciting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. And then the last thing was celebration. How many guys like to have fun and celebrate, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, y'all don't like to celebrate? Come on now. But I guarantee y'all play some, uh, what is that, that song, The Wild or something like that? Y'all would be all celebrating. Amen. <laughs> First Peter 4 13 says, But rejoice as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, what I was talking about is that one of the things that we've been talking with the kids about, there's a difference between praise and worship. Praise is an outward or physical show of adoration. Amen? So when you watch your favorite sports scene or when the preacher says something that you all like, you all give praise verbally, physically, in some way, shape, or fashion, you show praise. Now, worship, you can't show worship. Worship is an inward dealing. All right? Worship means a solemn expression of, of love. A solemn expression. So it's an inward expression of love. <coughs> Amen? Amen? So again, that's what I've been learning, yearning for. That's what I've been praying for. That's what I've been hoping for. Like I said, God will provide that to us. Amen? Amen? Amen. So let's go to the Word. Let's see how we can go ahead and, and figure out how we can get there. Now, this scripture that we're going to talk about is talking about the, the talents. Amen? Now, in order for us to get someplace or to, to get something, we have first, in this life, have to give something. Amen? Or be given something so that we can have something to give. So we go to verse 14, Matthew 25, and it says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called a service and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents, and gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me five with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to those who have the ten talents. For everyone who will, for everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Praise the Lord. So, as you know, this is in Matthew chapter 25. This is one of the last parables that God teaches about. Okay? I think there's one or two more that he may say. This is one of the last ones. But in verse 14, we'll back up a little bit. We'll see that everything that we have, God has already given us. Amen? Amen. We are called to him. He has given us his power, his ability, his might, his resources. He has ingrained that in us already. And we can see that in this parable of the 10 because it says in verse 14, he gave us the property that he had already. Amen? Let's, let's read it. Go back to verse 14. Go back up to the top. And entrusted his property to them. That was the last five words of that verse, or six words of that verse. And entrusted his property to them. So God's given us stuff that he already knows that we have, or God has given us part of the stuff that he has already. All right? And it's up to us to, to make it grow. Amen? Amen. So we better, we better recognize that all we have is not ours. God places within us all that we need already. Verse 15 through 18 goes on and says, God gives according to what can be handled. So we, he gave one talent, or he gave how many talents to one individual? Five. How many to another one? Two. Two, and then how many to another one? <laughs> All right, it was five, two, and one. The unique thing about this passage of scripture is, does the Bible say why he differentiated between the two or three? According to their talent. So why are we getting jealous about what somebody else has? If God's given us something according to our child, he's placed it all within us already, why do we get jealous about what somebody else has? The Bible does not explain why each person had those particular talents, except it was according to their ability. Each one of us has been given our own abilities, so why not manifest what we have? Let that grow. Give praise to God for what we have already. Amen? Amen. So, my gift is different from yours, and your gift is different from mine. The five talents is different from the two and the one. Amen? Amen? We don't know why God chose to give five, the two, the one, other than he knew that they could do something with it. Manifest, or use what God has given you to grow. Amen? Use it appropriately. Amen. So many times in our lives, we also, have, we also ask for specific directions. Does the Bible say that God told him what to do with those talents? No. Amen? Does it? No. no, it doesn't. It just said he gave it to him, and then he left. He left. I don't know about you guys, but I ain't giving nobody the keys to my house and leaving them there alone. <laughs> but that's what God did. God gave them his own property, or this man gave them his own property. God has given you a piece of him and told you to do what you need to do with it. You have the autonomy to do whatever you want to with it. So how many of you guys are walking in love, joy, and peace? Um, let's go on. Amen? <laughs> so those who gave, those who gave, did what? What happened to their funds that they gave? It doubled. It doubled. So let's think about it. If God gave them something, or this master gave them something, and it came back and doubled, who are we to know what the... We, it, Bible tells us right here. If we go ahead and just pursue what God has given us to do or told us to do, what's going to happen? It's going to multiply. But what, how much will it multiply? What? Ain't that what the Bible just said? So we know what we're, what we're looking for, but what, what hinders us in doing so? Fear. 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 Is God a creator of fear? No. Amen. Amen. So verse 19, 
is one of the ones that kind of, kind of stands out to me. Let's go to verse 19. It says, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Now, I was a licensed broker, stockbroker, so I'm familiar with the financial industry and how money works. There's a principle called the rule of 72. If you know about the rule of 72, raise your hand. One person knows about the rule of 72. Okay. So the rule of 72 is a financial principle that states that if you know the interest rate, okay, and you know how much money you're putting down, you should be able to tell how long it will take for you to double your money. So for instance, with the rule of 72, if I'm getting a 10% interest rate, how many years should it take for me to double my money? So you divide 72 by your interest rate, and how many do you get? About seven years. Amen? So if I have 72, the, the number is 72, okay? The 10% interest rate, so I have to do 72 divided by 10, that's about seven years. Amen? A little over seven years. All right? So let's do another one. So if I have a 5% interest rate, and I divide 72 by 5, how many years should it take for me to double my money? 14. Correct. Now, if I have a 3% interest rate, what am I looking at? 24. 24. All right? These are all biblical principles. Now, what strikes me in verse 19 was that the master knew this. The master knew this. At least, at least it seems to me that way. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. So he had an idea about what he should expect going forward. God's giving you a talent. He already knows what he wants to see from you. He knows what he wants to see from you. Are you going to be able to produce what he's looking for? Amen? Amen. So, just to help you all out some more. So one talent was 75 pounds of silver. Back in that day, that was roughly about $20,000. So if we equate that to today's money, they say it's about a million dollars. So he gave a million dollars to one guy, and this is out of his own property, $2 million to another guy, and $5 million to another guy. How many of you guys want to be one of those guys? Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, you are. I gave it to you already. Uh-huh. <laughs> Amen. But what are we doing with that? What are we doing with that? Again, God knows what he's looking to have come back. Are we doing what we need to do to get that principle to come back to him? Amen? Amen. In verse 20, verses 20 through 30, we see a principle that we like to say that favor ain't fair. Okay? But I always add on, but it is square. So what you've been given is for you. What I've been given is for me. So each one of us have our own square that we need to work in, and it's up to us to maximize the potential of that square. Amen? So we see a gracious, generous master who knows what to expect. He expected a return of some sort. He gave more to those he felt appropriately to do so. So equal expectations depend despite the size. So each one of them had expectation to bring back something besides what he just gave them. Amen? So all the servants, and this is another thing I thought was unique in this, all the servants acknowledge that they received something. We acknowledge that we received the Holy Ghost. We acknowledge that God died on the cross for us. We, got, we acknowledge that, that we want to go to heaven. We acknowledge a lot of things, but are we walking in that so that we can get that blessing? Amen? Amen. So each servant received compensation. Two received a much greater return. What was unique about their return was that once they gave them the double, once they gave the master the double, what, else, what did the master end up doing for them? What did he do? Give them more. He gave them more. He gave them more. The return that they got was far greater than what they even had to start with. So think about it. If I have $5 million, I go out and get $10 million, and I return, and he says, okay, listen, here you go. You get $300 million. I'm like, yes. But the one that had a $1 million gave back a $1 million. What did he do with that one? He took it away. And then what did he get? A far less return on his reward. He got penalized for being selfish. When we get to a point in our lives where we think that no one else can help us, that's when we're in the wrong. We are completely in the wrong when we think that no one else can help us. Amen? Remember, you've got talent. Look at your name and say, you've got talent. You've got talent. You've got the help. Amen. So, it's the parable that we acknowledge 
that our life is His. We were bought with a price, and that price was what? His blood on the cross for us. The fact that He died, buried, and rose again on the third day. That's a huge sacrifice, because I don't know about you guys, but I don't know if I could do that. Amen. And say that, I'm, and after you spat on me, whipped me, beat me, you're going to put, put some nails that are six to eight inches long in me too, and then going to expect me to forgive you? I mean, we look back at the cross, there was a guy on the right side of Jesus and a guy on the left side of Jesus. And one of the guys asked Jesus, hey, listen, why are you here? You ain't done nothing wrong. He's like, God, Jesus said, you know what? I recognize that. And because you've acknowledged that, you can be with me in paradise today. The dude that was serving right beside Jesus was able to go to heaven with him. We're not even seeing Jesus today. Okay? But yet, we say that we claim him. We say that we want to be like him. He's given us everything that we need in us, but we're not walking in the steps that we need to do. Amen? That's why I like the fact that, that we as a church, we're growing big time. I had a conversation with somebody about this recently. Our church structure changed for the better. Amen? Amen? We saw a need for us to grow, or we see that we are a growing church, and there's things that we need to have in place. So with us putting the structure down, we're laying a foundation for a solid, solid growth. Amen? Amen? So now that we have these different ministries and whatnot, we actually was able to capitalize on what our ministry focuses on. Man, so we have a brand that we have here that we're looking to pursue here at Word of Faith. We want to focus on our marriage ministry. Amen? Amen? Because what is the number one thing falling apart today? Amen. Marriages. Does anybody know what the divorce rate is now? Uh, it's more than 50, it's almost 60% right now. And whose work is that? That's people. And that's from us coming to our flesh and not abiding by the biblical principles that God has given us. Even in our own church. The church's divorce rate should be less than what it is in the world, but is it? No. Amen. So, with that, we need to go ahead and continue to focus on what God has given us because God has given us, not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, joy, peace. I'm sorry, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, meekness, temperance, against us there is no law. Amen? So let's go back to that rule of 72. Let's go back to the rule of 72, because I know some people like money. Amen. How many of y'all like money? How do you love money? Don't love money. Don't love money. What is the love of money? The root of evil. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that's the root of evil. Amen? Amen? So we work so hard to get that money, 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 money. But we shouldn't be working so hard to get it, because if we're resting in God, what's going to happen? He'll supply all your needs according to what? His riches and glory. Amen? Amen. So, back to what I was talking about with the worship piece. When I started this class, I did not know this book did, I did not know this book was going to teach me so much about worship and, and about myself. Amen? So one of the things I learned to do, and this thing has really helped me out, is get disciplined in my own spiritual life. Start praying more on a consistent basis. Start studying the, more, the word more on a consistent basis. So now I have a prayer time at night before I go to bed. I'll spend 5, 10, 15 minutes, but it's a set time every night now where I used to didn't do that before. Meditating. So when I drive to work, that's one way of meditating. I have about 25, 30 minute drive to work. I can meditate on it. But I'm still being distracted by other things around me. So what now what I do is I arrive to work early so I can sit down by myself and just meditate. Take all my cares, all my thoughts, all my desires, and give it to him. Let him work through it. Now, as you know, and some of you may know, I work for a local grocery store. Amen? And this local grocery chain went bankrupt. Now, it was a good type of bankrupt because it got rid of the debt. However, they started closing stores. And with the closing of stores, what happens with your jobs? You lose jobs. Amen? However, I was at peace throughout the whole process. The whole process. Not a single time did I worry about my job. Family, friends asking, hey, what's going on? Are you worried? What's going on with this? Do you know where you're going on? Nope. And then one day I got the phone call. 7 a.m. in the morning. Quill. Yes? I need you to come to the store right now. Okay. <laughs> and it's my boss talking. Yeah, um, how soon can you be here? Well, I'll schedule it in at noon. Well, I need you to come in before then, ASAP. 
All right, I'll be there. Click. Go to the store. My boss says, well, you know, I have to tell the team because I looked them up before 8 o'clock before the news got out, but your store is closing. How many of you guys would be in a state of turmoil if they told you your job was closing? My boss told me that. I said, okay, it's all good. She looked at me, I look at her. She looked at me, I look at her. She looked at me, I look at her. And I just start smiling. She says, you all right? I said, yeah, I'm blessed. Amen. She says, yeah, you are. You really are. She says, we already got plans for you. <laughs> I said, I don't want to worry about a thing. So the next question I asked her was, what about my people? What about my team? She says, guess what? Every store that we've closed, we've always placed people in another store. Those who wanted to stay will have a home. That's a huge blessing. Now, as a leader, you always want your people to be taken care of. Amen. Even if it's at your own sacrifice, at your own detriment, your people will always need to be taken care of. Amen. Amen? Amen. Jesus recognized this a long time ago. At his detriment, we gained. At his detriment, we gained. At his sacrifice, we gained. Amen? Amen. So now, she says, okay, listen, your story's closing. Okay? Your people get placed. We don't know when, we don't know where, okay. but we got to go through this whole process. So for the next 18 days, was it 18 days? Mm -hmm. For the 18 days, this is one of my former office managers, <laughs> previous office manager. For 18 days, we went through the process of having a building that had $1.4 <coughs> million dollars in product in it to zero. <coughs> one, of the, the, one of the company's flagship stores Went from $1.4 million of product in it to zero. The store had the number one for a reason, and it goes to zero in a matter of 18 days. We see the shelves go, the product go out of the store. They start selling the fixtures in the store, start selling everything. He comes down to the last few days in the store. I don't know where I'm going. My boss and I even question whether or not I even have a job. And every day I come in, hey, cool, how's it going? Hey, I'm blessed. Amen. Every day. You blessed? Yeah. Customers come in, oh, I'm so sorry to see you go. Well, why weren't you shopping in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> why would you, I always shop at, we ain't seen you. We ain't seen you, no, one day in the store. I live right across the street. You ain't been shopping here? <laughs> But God was looking out for us throughout the whole process, amen? amen? So now, comes down to the last two days, we have a few products up in the store. Last day come in, God comes in, 8 o'clock in the morning, pays $200 to buy us about $1,200 worth of product. I said, if I would known that was not this whole process a long time ago. <laughs> he buys all this product, we shut down the store, we go on the next day, close up the store, that day, my boss comes in and says, hey, Chloe, guess what? You're going to be going to the Pendleton store. I'm like, okay, great. Now, we get to this store, still don't know what's going on. Find out that when we get to the store here, more stores are going to be closing. More stores are going to be closing. Two weeks in this store, get a phone call. Hey, we need all store managers to come to this particular location. I'm like, okay, great. Here we go again. We go all the way across town to this, little, this, this particular location, and they say, okay, we want you to get people back in your stores. You won't. What? We want to know how can we get people back in your stores. Stop closing them. For one. <laughs> Lower your prices for two. Okay? <laughs> Start advertising for three. Invest in your people for four. You were you really want to keep going? Yes, we do want you to keep going. Okay? This is what we see down the road. We see that we, we have a chance to be bought out or be sold to somebody else. Okay, great. So what steps are we taking? Well, we'll we won't disclose that just yet. All right, it's a long process. Anyways, go on. Company gets bought by someplace, and then we hear, oh yeah, only we had a guy on the 55 stores. No, 45 stores. 45 stores was left. Some of you guys already know what I'm talking about. 45 stores was left. Announcement comes out. Hey, 
15 stores was bought by one company. 11 stores was bought by another company. The other 26 is going, or the other 18 are going to get shut down completely. We don't know who just yet, because we can't release it because of legal, uh, because of the law. Again, go to work. Hey, Quill, how you doing? I'm blessed. Yes, Amen. you are. Amen. Hey, Quill, how you doing? I'm blessed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Days go by. We still don't know what stores. We still don't know what stores. It could be the store that I'm at. I just got placed in this store. It could be shut it down again. So then we begin finally, because the word comes out. Out of the 15 stores, you're getting bought by a chain out of Ohio. Another 11 stores are getting bought by another chain out of Ohio. And the other 18, we can release those. You're going to be shut down. One caveat. The stores that are bought by the 11 stores, by the 11 company, the, the 11 stores that are bought by this other chain in Ohio, you all will be shutting down. And you all will be losing all your benefits, all your time tenure, everything that you possibly have, and you have to reapply completely. The 18 stores, I'm sorry, we're not moving you to any more stores because, in fact, we can't, do, we don't know what the other company has. The 11 stores won't take you. They're planning to have a job fair to maybe hire you, depending on if your skill set matches, but we can't promise you anything. The 15 stores, we don't know what to do with you guys as of yet because we don't know what the company's going to do. Hey, Quill, how you doing? I'm blessed. We get around to a few weeks ago. Our HR says, hey, listen, well, you 15 stores, but thankfully, praise the Lord, I am in one of those 15 stores. Amen. Amen. In fact, I'm now in one of the second highest grossing store in the company. Amen. I'm now a new, a new chain of 55 stores. Keep your time in, time in position. They keep their pay. They keep their vacation. The benefits may change a little bit, but they still have a job. Amen. Ain't that a blessing? Yeah. You're talking about you've got talent. You've got talent. What are you doing with the resources that you've been giving you? Amen. Throughout this entire process, every store I've been in, I tell the team members, listen, just do your job. Yeah. Focus on what you can control. Mm -hmm. If you get up in the morning, you're supposed to be in the deli making sandwiches, make de go in the deli and make sandwiches. Make the best sandwiches you can make. Amen. If you're supposed to be cutting meat, cut the best meat that you can cut. If you're supposed to be baking bread, make the base, best bread you can bake. If you're supposed to manage, manage the best department in the company, because you're blessed, walk in your blessings. Use the talent that God has given you. Amen? Amen. So the rule of 72 has been applied to my finances as well. As, you, as I said, I was a financial broker. My wife is still a stock broker, and we deal with finances a lot. So throughout this time period, my wife had a seizure. Amen? Amen. So when she had a seizure, that was traumatic for us because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what was going to happen. Using your talent, God allows you to have double blessings. So we go from making one salary to where we're both of us working at the same company, depending on both salaries in order to make it work. Now, I'm thankful that I'm in a position to, if something happens to her, we're covered because now I'm making twice as much as what we made before. Amen. 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 Just walk in your blessing. That's what God does for us. Amen. If we use this talent appropriately. So like service, we can invest immediately. We can start right now. We can start sowing the fruits of the Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, patience. Against us, there is no law. We will reap whatever it is that we sow. We can grow in ourselves, grow in our marriage, grow in our finances, grow in our health, grow in our careers, grow in this ministry. Because this ministry is truly growing. What are you doing to help sow into this ministry? Are you giving your time? Are you giving your finances? Are you giving whatever it is that you can in any way, shape, form, or fashion to canned goods for our food drive? Are you helping out with our vacation Bible school? Are you helping out with our outreach ministry? Are you helping out with the, the praise team? Are you helping out with the CD ministry? The we got a lot of ministries here. We can create our own ministry here as well. What are you doing to contribute? Use your talent wisely because you do have talent. Amen? Let's go before God in prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for this word that you gave us today to use the talent that you gave us appropriately and wisely, Lord. We thank you for giving us the knowledge that everything that we have is because of you and through you. And God, we thank you that we will not have the mindset that we're going to take the time just bury it into the ground and just hide it so that no one can see it, Lord. We're going to take it and invest in other people, invest in our church, invest in those around us, Lord, because through them, 
we can see their growth. Because it's more beneficial for us to save a life, Lord, than it is to, to give our own selfishly or to have our own selfishly, Lord. And Lord, as we go on into the next few days, months, weeks, and years, Lord, we ask that you continue to give us a mindset to give you the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So at this time, I'm going to say a prayer. And this book is going to pick up. So if anybody needs special prayer or one-on-one -on -one prayer, feel free to do so. Um, and we're going to say a prayer for those who have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. All right, if you could, for those of you that have your Bibles, everybody wonders.